Is it wrong to have Encanto LGBT headcanons? Okay, so I'm very upset and I figured I'd turn to Reddit for advice. I am 13, white, autistic, hyper empath. Recently, I made a now deleted post on TikTok of me with my LGBT headcanons. I woke up the next day to a lot of notifications that overwhelmed me a lot. Some people were saying I was ignoring the plot of the movie, which wasn't true as I love the plot of the movie and pay a lot of attention to it. My headcanons are simply a thing I just do with movies and TV I like. I tried to clarify I meant no harm and I did not mean to overshadow the movie at all. But when I did, I was called a ignorant white person. And this morning I was crying for hours that I had hurt people. I just want to have a civil conversation in the comments about this. Please no being mean or insults. On some month of some day in the year 1938, somewhere in Colombia, my maternal grandfather Fernando was born. I can tell you that he had an affinity for scorched rice and toupees, but I can't tell you his birthday or his hometown or his original last name because Fernando was an internationally wanted criminal, constantly on the run for some real estate scheme. At some point in his life in Colombia, he forged a Venezuelan birth certificate, left Colombia, and defrauded dozens of people in Venezuela until he left for the United States with my mother. And you know, one thing led to another and boom, my mother gave birth to a vaguely homoerotic, half pseudo-Venezuelan, half Mexican sociology major. Me. 83 years after Fernando's birth, Disney birthed the movie Encanto and offered audiences the story of an everyday teenage girl blessed to be the only non-magical person in a magical Colombian family. And as the only vaguely homoerotic person in my extended pseudo-Venezuelan family, I saw a bit of myself in Encanto. I have glasses, Mirabel has glasses, the rigidity of South American social roles cast Mirabel as an outsider, and I am a queerosexual who gets a lot of questions from my aunts and uncles. After watching the movie, I tucked my thoughts on the possible queerness of the scenario away until I stumbled upon the artery-clogging Reddit post presented earlier. Now, if you have a life, the previous Reddit post should have made no sense to you, and you should feel good about that. But I did understand what this person was saying, and to be honest, I felt bad that they had to experience the distress they did. Here's this 13-year-old kid just playing around on TikTok, and suddenly they were subject to discourse they probably aren't mature enough to properly digest. So why did people get so pissed? Because of words. Speaking of getting pissed, let's get pissed over today's sponsor. Are they gay merch? Is this an acceptable outfit to you? What about this? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you may be dealing with some latent heterosexual characteristics. If you need to let the world know that you're gay, consider checking out the Are They Gay merch store at www.itsall.gay. Here, all town lesbians can find the right fit for them. Or town bisexuals or gays. Prefer something more low-key? Try our pride umbrellas on shirts, sweaters, or socks. Or perhaps you need the world to know about our agenda. If so, let everyone know you're a bisexual disaster or a proud member of the homosexual agenda. Still not convinced? Use code BRUNO to get 15% off any order. Just visit www.itsall.gay, pick your design, don't forget to make sure you select the product you like the most, and enter the code BRUNO at checkout. Once again, that's www.itsall.gay. Hello, homosexual. Alex here with more thinly veiled Marxist propaganda. Like I said, Encanto is the story of a Colombian teenager with a vaguely bisexual aesthetic. Mirabel is the one person in her family born without magic powers, and as a result, feels isolated from her relatives and undervalued by loved ones like her grandmother. She seems destined to graduate with a degree in sociology from a prestigious liberal arts college, but instead, there's a mystery afoot. The family's magic is slowly dying. Well, Encanto lit the flame of a new fandom on TikTok, and within this Encanto fandom, a tension developed between those who supported theorizing over the queerness of this children's movie. Let's call them pro headcanon. And those who believe that Encanto's queer theories erases the cultural authenticity of the original movie. Let's call them anti-headcanon. And for those of you who weren't on Tumblr in 2014, 
A headcanon is simply a theory that someone has about a fictional work. Now, the obvious compromise should be, hey, it's okay to theorize about fictional character sexuality or queer allegories and pieces of media, as long as you don't overshadow marginalized narratives. But the internet loves to ignore all that is compromise and overcomplexify all that is obvious. The thing is, like, it's obviously fine to have LGBT headcanons, but a ton of white, non-Latino LGBTQ people completely ignored the plot of the movie and made it all about their LGBT headcanons. This happened a lot, especially on TikTok and Twitter. And that's a problem since the movie is about generational trauma that's very common with Latino families. I think some people, Latino and especially Colombian people especially, are understandably frustrated with all the talk of headcanons because, well, you get a mainstream movie that represents your culture, well, something that doesn't happen much, if at all. And then mostly foreign and white fans, who've never not had tons of media that represents them, only seem to be able to talk about this movie in one very specific way that doesn't even really have anything to do with the culture that's being represented, and very often actually completely ignores the context of the culture being represented. And that is, of course, extremely frustrating. Alright, so... How do we sift through the partly warranted and partly asinine discourse? Well, I shall be your guide. And your token. As a queer Venezuelan Mexican with Colombian characteristics, even I'm confused about the right answer. Should we let teenagers make headcanons about cartoon characters? Should we be concerned about the fact that there is more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere than at any time in human history? Boring. Let us call all discussions around Encanto a discourse. Headache also works. Within this discourse, people often use the phrases queer narrative or queer headcanon to signify the erasure of Latino identity. Within the Encanto discourse, people seem to separate the meaning of and Latino. Instead of separating and stratifying the discourse, I suggest that we open it. Queerness and Latino Americano can coexist, and it can coexist in Encanto. But how? Ultimately, my goal is not to talk about Bruno or Encanto. It's to talk about how Encanto reflects the ways that people use words and symbols in political struggles. I haven't seen gays and Latinos fight this much over a cultural property since Ricky Martin. But does it have to be a fight? In a supposed war between white queers and Latinos, which words mobilize which discourses? Let's take a look at these words. We can categorize the two sides of the Encanto discourse into two camps I mentioned earlier. Anti-headcanon and pro-headcanon. Of course, there are an infinite number of middle grounds, but as in many conversations, positions within the Encanto fandom seem to be mobilized around two extreme nodes. Two different poles that occupy our minds, even if we claim to be enlightened centrists who snort nuance like cocaine. Instead of presenting my extremely based position, let me first try to present both sides as charitably as I can. Now, I don't claim to represent either position in its totality. I'm simply constructing a representation that epitomizes what I believe to be the strongest points from each side. So, pro headcanon people might say something like this. Encanto is a story with a diversity of meanings. Some people read characters in the movie as queer as a form of self-expression and identity solidification. It's okay to read queer narratives in media because it can be liberating and affirm marginalized identities. Affirming marginalized identities is good, actually, and so stating that Encanto is a queer narrative is good. Conclusion? Gays. On the other hand, the anti-headcanon people might say, Encanto is a story about culturally specific experiences that Latinos share, including unique generational trauma. Stories authentically portraying Latino culture are rare in the mainstream media. A. Encanto represents this underrepresented marginalized group, Latinos, to empower the Latino community and validate their struggles. A is good. Queer readings of the character dynamics misrepresent and erase the cultural significance and specificity of interpersonal dynamics in Encanto. It is not okay to erase the authentic cultural background of the movie by a queer readings because it gets in the way of subpoint A. Conclusion? 
gays? Damn. Do you have an aneurysm yet? Am I right? Grow up. Anyways, homosexual children's movies. In one sense, the answer is obvious. People should be able to interpret media however they want, but some people take issue when privileged groups take ownership over the narratives of marginalized groups like Latinos. It's understandable. The only white person I want taking ownership of me is Paul McCartney in 1964. If we can't reconcile these two positions, what kind of shenanigans does the middle ground offer? I'm not Colombian, but I am Latino, and personally, I don't see anything wrong with having headcanons of the characters being LGBT. I guess as long as you don't ignore the main story of the movie, everything is fine. What does it mean to ignore the true message of Encanto? Why are TikToks of high schoolers calling Bruno a transgender rat man more readily the subject of anger than Bruno thirst traps? I feel so authentically represented, guys. Well, this is a fictional movie. There is no truth about it. It doesn't exist. Colombian culture exists for sure. Generational trauma exists, of course. Colombian arepas are real, even if inferior to Venezuelan ones. But Encanto, Mirabel, Isabela, Bruno, they don't exist. They're representations of ideas. So the debate about Encanto headcanons does not concern the realm of fact or truth. The discussion cannot concern whether someone missed the point of the movie because cultural objects mean multiple things in multiple contexts. Like, if I draw two balls and a cylinder, you'd guess that we're staring at the desk at the back of a sixth grade classroom, right? Yeah, maybe it is phallic, or maybe, It's Squidward. What we have to settle is a political struggle over the meaning of a cultural object. But these political struggles are in part normative or ethical struggles over power. So let's clarify our deeper moral positions. Before we can determine who is right and who is wrong in internet fights, let's clarify the standards by which we measure right and wrong. Is there anything gayer than the Western philosophical tradition? French literature? Let me draw out some moral positions I think we can all agree on. And if you don't agree with these moral positions, then there's no use talking about Encanto because, well, in that case, we've got some deeper work to do. So I propose racism is bad. Did I lose anyone? You never know with YouTube. All right, I might lose some of you on the next one. Homophobia is bad. You still with me? So if our ultimate goal is to minimize bad stuff like racism and homophobia, what steps should we take? Well, ever since Martin Luther King ended racism in 1964 and the gays were given glee, it's hard to tell. Okay, but let's just say hypothetically that racism and homophobia are kind of fundamentally embedded into modern society and purely theoretically. Let's say that you viewers out there want to minimize the amount of racism and homophobia in society. Some people suggest that media representation is a good start. Here's their argument. Representation in media helps empower people and legitimate their struggles. Minority groups should see representation of themselves in the media so as to distribute empowerment fairly and bring light to specific struggles. Through this empowerment, we can minimize stigma against minorities. Therefore, positive representation can minimize homophobia and racism. Do we agree? I'm guessing if you're on this channel and you've made it this far, you generally agree. Seeing people who hold your identities in powerful or positive positions makes it so that you believe you can hold these positions as well. Critiques of power itself aside, let's just simplify and say that representation can be a useful tool in combating oppression. So now that we've done a little bit of that, let's ask which position, anti-headcanon, or pro headcanon does a better job of fulfilling these moral positions. Both positions, anti headcanon and pro headcanon, agree that representation is a good thing, but only one position explicitly challenges the interpretive aspect of representation. The anti headcanon group generally argues that reading Encanto as a queer allegory and advocating for this reading leads to bad outcomes overall for other groups. In this sense, the anti-headcanon is a little incompatible with our positions because it denies a type of representation to certain groups and offers no alternatives. 
the anti-headcanon people close the discourse. However, the anti-headcanon people additionally argue that pro-headcanon positions erase the Latino cultural narrative through the dominance of the queer narrative. And we can't have the dominance of the queer narrative anywhere except Disney Channel original movies. Maybe it is true that some queer narratives have the potential to erase Colombian cultural narratives. So are both positions wrong? I'll get to your obvious existence in a second, Latina gays. Let's say that it's true that some non-Latino queer people speak so loudly about a queer narrative that they erase the cultural narrative. But then the problem in this instance isn't the queer reading, it's the act of erasure. And yes, I am aware that some people's queer interpretations have weird stereotypical justifications, but even in that instance then, the problem isn't the queer interpretation, it's the justification and the erasure of authenticity. All of these reasons to distrust queer narratives aren't actually about the fact of queer narratives. It's about what people think these queer narratives do. So how do we make queer readings non-erasing? You've probably been foaming at the mouth trying to get me to say it. Intersectionality. This is Silvia Rivera. She was a Venezuelan Puerto Rican trans activist who played a foundational role in early LGBTQ activism. At the same time that she was admired for her pioneering work, some groups hated what she represented. She openly spoke out against a growing division in the queer community between what she called a white middle class club and the poor trans youth of color that lived on the streets. In hopes of assimilating to the mainstream, the gay liberation movement didn't want to acknowledge that people like Silvia existed. Attendees booed Silvia off the stage of the 1973 Christopher Street Gay Pride Parade for making this inequality heard, and to an extent, she was ousted from the mainstream gay community as some gay activists became more assimilationist and trans-exclusionary. Yet Silvia couldn't return to the original Latino community from which she was excluded when she was 11 years old for being labeled too effeminate. Looking back, what is Silvia's story about? Is it about being a Latina, being LGBTQ+, is it about being trans, is it about class? It's none of these things alone. Silvia's story only makes sense when those power structures are understood simultaneously. These politics of separation have not gone away. If I wanted to make a video about Encanto, I would have made one where I said intersectionality held of my queer Latino identity as a badge of honor, but realistically protection, and called it a day. But I didn't want to make a video about Encanto. I wanted to make a video about how people are erased from discourse and how intersectionality gets us out of the mud and maybe out of the closet. When Kimberly Crenshaw first coined the term intersectionality, she introduced the framework to explain the ways black women were uniquely affected by the intersections of gender and racial oppression. Intersectionality does not suggest that for example, a bisexual person of color like Chad from High School Musical is double oppressed and a gay white guy like Troy Bolton is only singularly oppressed. It instead suggests that dependent on one's different positions within certain social categories, people find themselves at the intersection of different power structures. This produces both a unique and cumulative experience with oppression. A queer Latina does not simply face the cumulative effects of racism, sexism, and homophobia, but she also experiences the unique way that racism, sexism, and homophobia intersect to constrain her autonomy. Sure, there's an overlap in the ways queer Latina women and queer Latino men experience the world, but they are also oppressed in different ways. The terms used against queer Latina women are unique. Racism, sexism, and homophobia inform each other. Let's apply this to the Encanto discourse. Imagine the Encanto discourse to be this blob. And imagine that these squiggles are just floating words that people throw around when talking about Encanto. Sometimes these floating squiggles of words form an identifiable mass. 
and sometimes people identify themselves with the identifiable mass of words. Post-Marxist theorists Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe would call these masses subject positions. When people are immersed in a discourse about something, they locate themselves in that discourse. In other words, they take on an identity from which to speak about something. And most of the time, they don't even choose to take on this identity, it's just handed to them by circumstance. So in simple term, this identity that falls into people's lap through discourse is a subject position. In the Encanto discourse, there's a variety of subject positions. There's... Camp A, a queer subject position. Not to be confused with Camp Gay, which is an extremely offensive stereotype. Then there's Camp B, the Latino subject position. Somewhere over here, there's Camp C, the white subject position. And unknown to everyone, apparently, there's Camp D, the queer Latino subject position. And we can go on indefinitely. But here are the important ones for our analysis. Now, being Latino does not automatically mean you belong to the Latino subject position. Rather, certain ways of speaking about things have been labeled Latino. For example, in the discourse of cleaning products, the Latino subject position might articulate or say that fabuloso is the best snack for a Tuesday morning. The white subject position might articulate that no, actually, Tide Pods are the way to go. This does not necessarily mean that white people love Tide Pods. It means that there are certain ways of speaking about a subject. And certain ways of speaking about this subject have become so loaded with meaning that they take on labels like white or Latino. I can't believe Alex from Are They Gay, more like they are poop, just said all Latinos speak a certain way. Cringe department, hashtag canceled. Yes, I'm making generalizations, but not about people, about the way we label certain positions. Somewhere along the way, the Latino subject position became associated with an interpretation of Encanto that centers Latino narratives, but is exclusive of queer narratives. Why? Well, on the one hand, there are white queer people who misinterpret culturally specific signals and appropriate these signals, essentially erasing the ethnic content of these signals. But at the same time, it's a little homophobia, a little bit. Not homophobia in the classic vas al infierno type of way, but more homophobia in the subtle liberal evangelical Chris Pratt type of way. <laughs> yeah, I tolerate all people. Notice how people critical of headcanons talk about queer interpretations. At the same time that people within the discourse create the Latino subject position, they're also creating the meaning of the queer subject position. These subject positions inform each other, right? It's a discourse, so they talk to each other. The Latino subject position, whether implicitly or explicitly, whether intentionally or unintentionally, equivocates the queer subject position with whiteness. OP, I'm not saying you were disrespecting my culture. Go on TikTok. The vast majority of content about the films is about the character's sexuality, and Latinos are getting tired of telling everyone what the problem with that is and white people ignoring us. You were just caught in the crossfire. Now, again, this doesn't mean that all Latino people talking about Encanto equivocate queerness with whiteness. I'm talking about general trends in labeling a specific type of discourse. Everyone who agrees are white, Lamal. Let POC films rest with the LGBT headcanon. It's offensive and very annoying. White queers always feel the need to bring sexuality when it comes to movies and series. It's weird. I want to emphasize that these general trends do not indicate that people speaking from a certain subject position have bad intentions. In fact, they have good intentions. At the end of the day, we're all just trying to end racism and homophobia, right? We are all just caught in a systemic problem. The inequalities that permeate society bleed into every corner of our discourses in complicated ways. Being homophobic isn't a day job you commute to Boston for. Anyone can perpetuate homophobia in the subtle ways 
They contribute to certain discourses or silence others. The problem with closing discourses is that you will never account for the totality of experience. The politics of gatekeeping ends up becoming a politics of erasure with unintended consequences. While I understand, as a Latino person, the deep urge to protect a culture that has been demonized for generations, at what point is this less about protecting the so-called authentic narrative of the movie and more about trying to legitimate your unfortunate experiences with representation by attacking a group that's marginalized within your own community? Do you think if I look up Encanto LGBT headcanons on TikTok and look at the comments of a video, I'm going to find nuanced critiques of the ways white queer people co-opt the experiences of communities of color? <music> Discourses maintain inequalities, but inequality is not just maintained through discourses of hate. It is additionally maintained through a lack of discourse, through invisibility, through a closure. What is the systemic problem? The Latino subject position, as it has manifested so far with the Encanto discourse, essentially erases the queer Latino subject position. The queer subject position, as it has manifested so far on TikTok, also erases the queer Latino subject position with its cultural ignorance. And the white subject position, well, you know what you guys did. As a system, these discourses erase subject positions with the least amount of systemic power. People often do this with good intentions, but their intentions don't matter. One of the most insidious things about systemic oppression is the ways it redirects the actions of well-meaning actors. And it's not that you're homophobic for saying Encanto isn't gay. Not at all. The problem is when you demonize queer interpretations as being inherently antagonistic. So if the queer interpretation isn't yours, that's fine. But closing off the movie and saying that it can never be queer and assuming that queer white people are the only ones claiming this queerness ignores the complex meanings within the movie. This isn't the direct fault of anyone speaking from or on the behalf of the Latino subject position. The real problem is systemic. At the intersection of homophobia and racism, the Latino position is so discursively marginalized that it is often left unarticulated and unspoken. It doesn't fit into the queer box where culturally specific Latino signifiers are erased by unknowing non-Latinos, and it doesn't fit into the Latino box where queerness is subtly equivocated with whiteness and outsiderness. In essence, none of the current dominant discourses advocate for true representation if they erase queer Latino people from the narrative. And as we established earlier, homophobia and racism, pretty bad. Pretty bad. Without an intersectional lens, queer Latino people are made to feel like enemies. Their subject position is unarticulated. Just look at this popular TikTok. This movie is not an allegory for being a closeted queer person. It's the struggles of unrealistic expectations and generational trauma. Because this person is working within a binary framework in which the Latino and queer subject positions are irreconcilable, they can't possibly conceive of how to bridge this gap in meaning. Well, if we were to be a little intersectional about it, we might interpret those unrealistic expectations as informed by the heteronormativity prevalent in mainstream Latin American culture. This interpretation might open up a space for queer Latino people to talk about how generations of very Catholic and socially conservative traditions in their families created an atmosphere of silence and oppression. Is that so much of a stretch? Am I a silly camp gay? We're hinting at the solution. Instead of closing these locations in a discourse, we should open the discourse Proclaiming that cultural artifacts have stable structural meanings is so 20th century sociology. What are you, a structural functionalist? <laughs> Any meaning you apply to cultural material is going to be disrupted by the multiplicities that other people already apply. Static meanings only serve to delegitimize other meanings. So the solution is not to advocate for the erasure of narratives that center queerness and encanto. 
The solution is to advocate for culturally relevant queer readings. The idea that Encanto can only be queer or only Latino is a product of a harmful binary thinking. If you're going to protect Encanto as authentic representation of South America, then why would you imply that queerness cannot be a part of that narrative? Especially when queer South Americans are marginalized within their own communities. I wonder. The problem is where they completely ignore the point of the movie and just try to make things about them. So many people online advocate for the point of the movie, the real meaning, the real audience. Don't wipe back to front. Let's clarify something. This is a Disney movie. Disney made this movie with the intention of making money. That's why most of you probably saw this movie in English. And that's why they hired the extremely popular Puerto Rican songwriter, Lin-Manuel Miranda, to write the bulk of the music and not some Colombian artist. So let's stop talking about who it was made for because empirically, on a factual level, it was made by Disney for general audiences. The initial development of the themes in Encanto were developed by two cocks, Brian Howard and Jared Bush, who first intended this movie to be a story on big families rather than any culturally specific group. Bush and Howard conceived of three points that became the basis of Encanto's story. Most of us don't feel truly seen by our families. Most of us carry burdens we never let our family see. And most of us are oblivious that nearly all of us, especially within our own families, feel the exact same way. These are sentiments that people from all walks of life relate to. I'm sure queer people especially relate to these three points, Latino or white. Disney always makes movies with the intentions of broad appeal. And while Bush and Howard eventually made the conscious effort to include Latina storytellers like Cherise Castro-Smith once they knew their story would be set in Colombia, they intended for the story to have a universal message, even if situated in a specific culture. But ethically, now that we know that the movie has been put out into the world and does concern culturally specific signifiers, who should the movie be for? Who should decide the narrative? That's a tough question. But I do know that the communities represented in this film probably have a bigger stake in owning the cultural meaning of this film than most other groups. This film is important for South American people because this is one of the few images of us that gets projected onto a mainstream audience that isn't Pablo Escobar, even if his life story is a banger. It makes sense that Latino people are hesitant to hand over control of their narrative to supposed outsiders. But queer people aren't outsiders to Latino communities. Let's talk about Bruno. For real. I don't know how people say this movie has absolutely no queer aspects to it. First, the whole black sheep thing is classic Latino gay. Did we forget the experience of being the one queer person in your very machista Latino family? Did we forget the ways that millions of queer Latino people have that one uncle or aunt that we're not supposed to talk about because we're all supposedly super Catholic, but we love gossip and chisme, so let's talk about gay uncle Bruno anyways. That one uncle or aunt we inexplicably relate to, only to find out that we share an identity with them. An identity that you can't talk about with anyone else except them. So that's a little gay. Let's look at uh, Isabella. Sure, maybe Isabella, the character who doesn't want to marry a man that she doesn't love, isn't a lesbian because of that fact, and is genuinely forced by the significance of social status in Latino communities to enter a loveless marriage. But isn't it also possible that queer Latinas might relate to the way that heteronormative social status in Latino communities especially limits queer Latinas' autonomy? Maybe Isabella isn't one of these people, but this reading can come from a place of genuine experience rather than stereotyping. Yes, queerness isn't the only part of the interpretation of these characters, but their interpretations as such does not inherently negate the other complex cultural meanings these characters embody. Not all queer people are white. Exhibit A. When asked about the possible queerness in Encanto, the actress who plays Mirabel, Stephanie Beatriz, had this to say. 
I think that's really special that as a queer person that you saw that in the film. Because I don't know if it's been laid in by the filmmakers or not, but I think the best pieces of art are the ones that you feel connected to and can identify with. I think the thing that you're probably maybe picking up on is this feeling of feeling like an outsider in your own family and feeling not accepted by the people that you want to love you the most. And I think many people in the queer community can feel that way, right? Queerness fundamentally mediates the way that some Latino people experience their culture. We all relate to our culture in different ways and we do a disservice by erasing these stories. So, what would I say to the 13 year old that made that first Reddit post or any other 13 year old confused about where they belong in a discourse? Let me read you a quote from Gloria Ansaldúa. Your allegiance is to la raza, the Chicano movement, say the members of my race. Your allegiance is to the third world, say my black and Asian friends. Your allegiance is to your gender, to women, say the feminists. Then there's my allegiance to the gay movement, to the socialist revolution, to the new age, to magic and the occult, and there's my affinity to literature, to the world of the artist. What am I? A third world lesbian feminist with Marxist and mystic leanings? They would chop me up into little fragments and tag each piece with a label. You say my name is ambivalence? Think of me as Shiva, a many armed and many legged body with one foot on brown soil, one on white, one in straight society, one in the gay world, the man's world, the women's, one limb in the literary world, another in the working class, the socialist and the occult worlds, a sort of spider woman hanging by one thin strand of web. Who, me? Confused? Ambivalent? Not so. Only your labels split me. For those of us who do not have the privilege of embodying universal categories, I suggest we open the discourse. Encanto is a movie about people. Sure, people in a specific context, but people are not just their context. La forma en que nos relacionamos fundamentalmente con los contextos no debe convertirse en una lucha política de diferentes contextos exclusivos, sino una lucha política contra las cosas que dividen nuestros contextos personales de maneras que hacen inalcanzables nuestras identidades. But it's your choice how you want to engage with media. All I ask is that you try to do it with some conscience, that we open more borders than we create. Is Encanto a movie imbued with queer Latino experiences? Do queer readings take away from the meaning of the movie or do they complexify its meaning? You decide. Hey, gay. You want to act gaily daily? Well, here's a few ways you can do that. Support this channel by checking out my merch at www.itsall.gay or consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, remember to follow my Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe. Anyways, these are some people who are acting gaily daily. My patrons. Emily, Pop Unicorn, Brian Lasoya, Thomas Oshagan Halagian, Aurelia Chilinska, Rising Sun, Grackle, Kara, Duncan, Lorenzo J. Yanez Jr., Anarkali Ascari, Darren Mad, Elizabeth Acosta, Violet, Amara, E. J. Patrick, Evan P., Steffi, Cece, Knights Who Say Sledge, Enar Dominguez Elvira, Etienne, Jessica Carmona, Night Tripping Fairy, Testy Tara, Nadine Ferris, Leonardis Sardinianis, Miguel Galan de Juana, Tanya P., Rowan, Roman Rosari, CC Troye, Violet Fabiana, Adrienne Jackson, Maddie Reyes, Cody Miller, Juicebox08, The Kimchi Witch, Cucumber, AFK Bard, Feeler, Ryro, Del Elliott, Charlotte, Daniel Prokop, Elizabeth Morgan, Madison Fife, Kale, Gabriella Day, Shido, Autumn Moore, Lilytron, Marie, Nicholas Bloom, Mysterious DG, Gary K, Sean O'Neill, Whitney Welts, Cooper, Mally Drew G. Enoch Koo. You really don't have to read my name. 
Jackie Benavente, Kimothy, Gray Jedi, Ruben Capetillo, Soup, L.E.M., Kristen Price, Jambo, Lucia Garcia, Taylor White, Sonny Leitome, Tiff, Fate Replay, The Cassowary, 